I spoke last time about cosmology, uh, which is something I don't know if you know anything about, and astronomy for that matter, and theories of astronomy in this period. And I, uh, taking the course as a whole, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, what goes on outside the earth. So the epic has gone up to the gods, looked at heaven from the vantage point of heaven. We've gone down to the underworld as well and um, seen how these, under, the, these sort of uh, vantage points other than the earthly are brought into literary uh, works, um, including in Beowulf, he goes down and to the bottom of the earth which is a down into the de depths of the water where uh, Grendel's mother is. Uh, but Dante had his inferno down in the bowels of the earth and his paradiso up above Mount Purgatory, etc. cetera. Um, we haven't really talked about, about stars and constellations, although it was there in the Aeneid as well to some degree, at least the uh, view of the ancient world that the great kings eventually become stars, a part of the firmament, the celestial firmament, and thereby, thereby be, are being divinized. And uh, while they're walking on the earth, they are earthly representations, but one day they'll, they'll take their place in the heavens with the other gods um, of which they are already members. There's a sort of a divinization going on there. Um, and so a connection between uh, religious views and astronomy there. And that view of astronomy gets strongly intertwined with all sorts of areas of knowledge because the ancient view of things is that there are certain, only a certain number of uh, properties inherent in nature and in human nature and they're common properties. So we can speak in terms of microcosms and macrocosms. And uh, you know what I mean by microcosm? Did I mention that in the other class? I can't recall. But a microcosm is literally a little cosmos. And a macrocosm is a large cosmos. And a cosmos uh, is a word to describe the whole celestial order. And uh, it has connotations of obviously grandeur, but it also has connotations of beauty. The word cosmos is also used for uh, like a bauble or a trinket, an intricately uh, wrought Christmas ornament. So they look at the heavens and they see uh, something almost like ornamental. We, we also get the word cosmetics from it, by the way. Wonder where the word cosmetics come from, the paint that you put on your faces, that's to make your faces shine and, and glisten like, like the cosmos. Um, and at, at any rate, the idea that we are made of the same stuff as the cosmos and that we can draw analogies between the way the world works or the universe works and the way our, our own human nature functions is a very ancient one. It goes back to the certainly in our, uh, in terms of our course, uh, to the ancient Greeks, the pre-Socratic period, talk about things in these terms, and so does Plato for that matter. Uh, and I mentioned the Republic, remember we talked about the allegory of the cave, and in that study, which he call, we call the Republic, or hey, polis, the polis, the city, um, he talks about justice and observes that what is true of, for a human being is also true of the city. So it, and he says it's easier to talk about justice for a city than it is for an individual, so let's, let's talk about the city. But he assumes that what is true there will also be true here. So what's true on the big scale, on the macrocosmic scale, will also be true on the individual microcosmic scale. So there isn't different types of justice. There's only one justice. And it's true for the individual, it's also true for everything else. 
Uh, and that general perspective is holding uh, from all the way from the ancient world to, to this time that we're discussing here. And there are certain implications for that. But one of them is um, a certain certitude about discussing things like, let's say like justice, that don't admit to perspectivalism. So there isn't justice for this person or this group, which is, also, which is going to be unjust to another group. It's just or it's not just, but it's true across the board. And um, so we can talk about beauty, truth, and goodness in, in almost absolute terms. We're not going to relativize it. But come the scientific revolution, um, another theory of the cosmos was gaining a little popularity cir uh, circulation, uh, that of uh, Nicholas Copernicus. It's an ancient view, actually. Um, but it was one of the theories that was um, considered, but, but more or less considered to be less accurate than the one which w they inherited, the Ptolemaic view. Um, but come the, this period, the addition, the, the, the shift towards a Copernican cosmology came about because of the discovery by a telescope, by Galileo, that the Jupiter did not revolve, uh, did revolve around the sun, and perhaps you could see it as revol revolving around the earth, but what we could observe was not revolving around the sun or the earth was the moons of Jupiter. Jupiter had its own moons. They were revolving around Jupiter. And so that didn't fit with the idea that everything revolves around the earth or even the sun for that matter. It, it had seemed to have its own independent workings that were not connected to everything else. And there were things like supernova and so forth. And these things didn't fit the model of cosmology. And so the cosmology of Copernicus was gradually more and more strongly embraced to the point where they said, well, the old cosmology simply doesn't, it's not scientific. It doesn't, doesn't hold true. And uh, so last time I talked about how this shift was received in the period and the implications of it. I, I didn't talk about it as much as I could have there, and I'm not going to talk about it too much more here. I spend a whole course in 17th century literature really teasing it out because it, I think it's a, it's a seismic shift. Uh, but for John Donne, who I introduced to you last time, he continues to use this idea of a change uh, in relation to all manner of things. And in the works that we're going to look at today, the Holy Sonnets, he's going to look at them in terms of uh, his, his main theme which is that of a person who gets sick and goes through various stages which, uh, in which the sickness may lead to death. Uh, but he's regularly going to employ this idea of a microcosm and a macrocosm. He's going to speak of himself as a little, a little world. And he's going to make comments on him, his own state of health in relation to the world and vice versa. If there's something going on in the political sphere, he will see it as having a parallel to something that relates to him individually, personally. So he will continue to employ the microcosm, macrocosm analogy that we see all the way uh, throughout the Western tradition. And not just through the Western tradition, by the way. This is also true of Eastern philosophy. Um, there in the sort of the yin and the yang, right? There's a something in everything, and there's something that is in everything is can be found in. So what you can say here will relate over here, and there's a, so there's a unifying character to all of that. Um, but Dunn, because he has a different cosmology also in view, is aware of a problem with that sim the simplicity of that. But the but these. Sonnets that I'm going to look at, the holy sonnets, are related to health, and I'm, I'm not going to look at all of them. I'll put them up here on the screen behind me, and you'll see that there are 
Uh, 14 of them are in view here. I'm not, I'm not going to go through them all, but they are a sequence. And there's a progression between the sonnets. So a sonnet, by the way, I should say something about a sonnet. A sonnet is a literary form um, which arises in the Renaissance. It's not an ancient literary form. We don't find it in the Greeks or the Romans. They don't write sonnets. It was invented in the Italian Renaissance by probably by a man by the name of Francesco Petrarch, one of Dante's, Dante's, one of Dante's contemporaries. And it's a 14-line poem. Uh, in the Italian or Petrarchan form, it uh, has a certain structure, an octave and a sestet. So it has eight lines that are more or less self-contained, and then it moves to a six-line unit. And then uh, in the English-speaking world, there's a little bit of play with it. It still remains a 14-line poem, but it, there's, uh, the, the rhyme scheme can change internally, and it gets a little bit more flexibility in, in Shakespeare's use, for instance, because he doesn't write an eight and a six-line poem. He writes three, four lines and then a rhyming couplet at the end. It allows more flexibility of theme and so forth. But Dunn is writing holy sonnets. Now, holy sonnets are devoted specifically to God. And as I say, they are related to, uh, to that topic, but they also relate to his grand themes of health and sickness. Because in Christian thinking, Sickness is not a natural occurrence. It's a consequence. And it's a consequence of sin. Because death is a consequence of sin. And, right, so in, in, in the beginning, in the garden where God created mankind in his own image, there, w there is no mention of death. There's life with God, and there's a sense of order and perfection. We looked at that a little bit when we looked at that brief look at Genesis. No mention of sickness or death there, and the consequence of sin is death, however, and that's one of the, uh, one of the hallmarks of <coughs> uh, the accounts of Genesis, of the generations that followed, is that it... Uh, talks about somebody who lived for, gives a certain timeline for how long they lived and then it finishes with, and they died. So it's a new thing. It's not there in the beginning that death was a part of life, but it becomes one after the fall. And sickness likewise. That's the theme of the general theme of Dunn's holy sonnets. It, and it will trace the stages of sickness and deal with the problem of sickness and health and take it not as a natural thing that we should die, but in some sense as a punishment for sin and to some degree presented as an enemy of life because anyone who's been sick uh, regards illness, sickness, infirmity as uh, something that is not uh, favorable to them. It's something, host something hostile to them. So with that in mind, Dunn will play with that. And he will play with the cosmology as well and how that relates to it. So I'm, I'm going to go through some of the poems in the sequence. I'd like to go through more of them, but and if you're interested, you can see them on my, my YouTube channel. I, I deal with more of them. But for the purposes of this class, I'm just going to look at, I think, three, starting with the first, and then I'll go to the fifth. And I don't think I'm going to do the 10th. I think I'll go to the 14th at the end of that. But let me begin with the first one. And note that they are directed uh, to God. And they are addressed to God. The uh, first line here. Thou hast made me, and shall thy work decay? Uh, one of the things that you will note about these poems is that Dunn is doing something that later writers will, would call apologetics. He's dealing with the problems that arise from uh, in, in human life as a consequence of certain beliefs that Christians hold and the apparent contradictions with that. 
And the apparent contradiction is that God made us and God is good. And yet what he made is not good. Namely us. This is a problem. It's a problem for the assertion that God is good. If he makes something that ends up not being good, then is the one who made it actually good? Well, then we introduce the idea of free will and everything that arises out of that. As a, you know, it's a, as a consequence of the possibility of choosing something other than God, evil needed to be a possibility, but God didn't plan on that, so it's got not God's fault that evil exists. It's a condition of our human nature, being made in the image of God. God was not forced to create the world. We're not forced to sin, but we chose to do it. Anyway, but still there's the problem. A good God has created a creature who not only is not good, but evil, and not only is not healthy, but is sick. And prone to all the consequences of sin. So that's what he will talk about. I'll read the whole thing. Thou hast made me, and shall thy work decay? Repair me now, for now mine end doth haste. I run to death, and death meets me as fast, and all my pleasures are like yesterday. I dare not move my dim eyes any way. Despair behind, and death before doth cast such terror, and my feeble flesh doth waste by sin in it, which it towards hell doth weigh. Only thou art above, and when towards thee by thy leave I can look again, I rise again. But our old subtle foe so tempteth me that not one hour myself I can sustain. Thy grace may wing me to prevent his art, and thou, like adamant, draw mine iron heart. You know what adamant is, by the way? It's, it's a very hard, it's just something ex exceptionally hard. Um, and he's probably thinking of something along the lines of magnetism here. Uh, did you, in... Uh, your physics classes, did you ever look at the effect of, uh, of magnetism, the, the old iron filings and magnet experiments? You do that so you could see the magnetic fields. You, you put the magnet down and then you throw the iron filings down and it, they show a pattern there which you could not see. It was an invisible thing. There was a magnetic field and you would never have known that it was there were it not for the iron filings falling right in a certain pattern. And so, so there's an unseen force that attracts and pulls, and God is being compared to this force that pulls, that a force that you can't see except by the effect. But if you had to say, well, there, the God's caused that, well, there's no, I don't see anything there. But he does see. That's how he concludes with it. But there, but note that it's personally addressed. It's addressed to God. I says, I say, it is a, a, a sonnet, and so a sixteen-line poem. It has a certain rhyme scheme. So, if just to talk, when I'm talking about rhyme scheme here, I'm talking about the end of the line of each successive line and how it sounds. So, decay. I, uh, let's just mark it out by calling that a line. A sounds like a. Haste is not the same, so let's call that B. Fast is close enough to haste that it will count as a rhyme, so we'll call that B as well. So there's A, B, B, and then yesterday is the same as the first line, so we'll call that A again. So it's A, B, B, A. Way, past, waste, way. Same thing, A, B, B, A. So A, B, B, A twice. First eight lines, can you see that? So it has, a, there's a, a pattern, a symmetry, an order to it within the structure of the poem. Whatever happens within the poem, all the, the themes and ideas that arise out of it, it's presented in a certain form that suggests order and, and harmony even. And in the case of the poem, there's a lot of disorder and disharmony and distress. 
the person is upset within the context of order there's still a subjective impression that things are out of control well this is exactly what will happen to you if you're sick you might be aware that there's an order going on but your life is totally disordered you can't get off your sick bed your head is swimming because you have a thumping headache a high fever you can't see straight with dim eyes well if you've got enough of a fever your eyes are all blurry <coughs> this is what he, he's talking about but note the context though so let me not to interrupt myself here so with with way it we have the conclusion of the octave and then we'll move on to the sestet the again me sustain so the the we have not seen any line that is like that so we'll call that a c again no precedent so it's the me is like the c d sustain is like again so d and then at the end we get a couplet art and heart no precedent for it before that so it goes c d c d e e at the end it is still a Petrarchan sonnet with an octave and a sestet, but it concludes with a rhyming couplet. It's a little, a little twist on the form. So it gives a really tight finish. A rhyming couplet at the end of a poem suggests a strong closure to the poem, thematically and otherwise. Right? I mean, you can hear it as well. When there's a rhyming, two lines that rhyme, it seems to end decisively. No, there's no sense that the, that the problem is carrying on. It's, it's enclosed. But within that sense of order and, and, and closure, <coughs> there's a lot going on within it. And one of the ways we can see uh, the way in which a lot is going on is simply by contrast. Let me give you a different illustration. If you are looking at... Uh, buying a diamond. Anyone ever bought a diamond ring? You go into a, well, I've done it. Wife's rat, wedding ring, so forth, right? You go in and they show you the diamonds. Do you know how they show them to you? First of all, they have brilliantly intense white light. And it is white light. It's very bright white light. And they have a backdrop. And the backdrop is black. It's matte black. It's very black velvety it sort of absorbs all the light it doesn't reflect any light at all it takes the light doesn't reflect it but one thing does reflect it and that's the diamond it the light sparkles off it and so because of the contrast between the matte black background and the bright light which is reflecting off it the the, the diamond really sparkles and to some degree that's how art can also work and it does here there's a strong sense of order in the structure of the poem but the ideas that are going on it are very disordered and expresses dissatisfaction, distress. This is what I uh, say about principles of art. <coughs> but even notions of, of, of human personhood in our day, there's a lot of uh, uh, references to self-identification and so forth. I want to be myself. You have to acknowledge my pronouns, whatever, right? That's sort of language of to be myself. But if you really want to be yourself, you have to acknowledge that there's a pattern to which you also fit. And not just that you're unique, because uniqueness as a self-referential terms doesn't mean anything. An individual means something when you see it compared to somebody else, oh, there's the difference, right? But as a wholly self-referential term, it's not saying a whole lot. I'm unique. Okay, <laughs> so what? How do you know that that's true? Actually, how do you know that you're, you're unique? It seems, I mean, you can say something true about yourself, but you're, you're now you're commenting on other people by implication, right? The claim of uniqueness is a comparative claim. That's what's going on here to some degree. There's a comparison being made uh, and it, there's a context for it. Now, I'm not, uh, these are all just illustrations, but they're m making a certain point and uh, and there's a broader purpose to that in terms of uh, teaching young people like yourselves about in our age of identity politics and all this sort of stuff 
Um, how do I know who I am? And how do I know how I fit? And how do I you know, really express myself so that I really know who I am? And part of it is by comparison and seeing how others have expressed themselves and understand themselves. And, and in the backdrop of all that sort of rich black background, the, the brightness can come out. Likewise here, but he's going to use the categories that he's inherited from Christian theology and also from the cosmology of the day and the physics of the day and so forth. Well here, but the idea here at the outset is of a personal God who has created him. He refers to him as thou. Um, people don't use the word thou these days in English. It's sort of antiquated language, or at least most people don't in the Lord's Prayer, perhaps. Um, but even when they do, they tend to misunderstand the purpose of referring to someone as a thou. Uh, we think it is a, a term of reverence because we, the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, our Father, right? So it's very reverent language. That's the purpose of using it. And so it, with reverence, there seems to be a distance, you know, respect. You're up there, I'm down here. But that's actually not what thou does as a pronoun. Thou is a term of intimacy. You don't do it to, you don't call a stranger thou. I could make this point much easier in, a, in Spanish or French or German or another language <clears throat> because they held on to the, the personal pronoun uh, of intimacy and the polite form which in today, today's English is the only form that we use. We use the word you. That's the polite form. So I'll speak to all you as you. But I would never refer to you as thou unless you were very close to me and I knew you very well. It's reserved for that. It's for, for, for familiar relations. Your wife, your husband, your children. Otherwise, you, you use you. Respect. Polite language. In English, as I say, we only use the polite term now. But here he's using not the impolite term, but the intimate term. This is a God he knows, and he knows loves him. So he speaks to him as thou. Thou hast made me, and shall thy works decay? So the question is being thrown to God. It's his problem, but also it's God's problem. This is a theological problem. But of course it applies to him. And the reason it applies to him is because he is one of the works that's decaying. Repair me now is then his command. Repair me now, for now mine end doth haste. Feels like he's going to die. <coughs> I run to death and death runs towards me. Uh, death is personified here. It's almost like they're two lovers. Remember we saw in uh, every man, death comes forward as, as a, a summoner, a messenger of God. Here is almost like a lover. Death's coming for me. Oh, great. So good to see you, death. I'm running towards death and death is running towards me. This is a rather gruesome picture, but that's exactly what's happening. And this is not a, there's not a good outcome to this. Because the, because the me that he refers to in line one is not going to exist after the death that comes in line three. And yet I'm running towards death. Now in what sense is he running towards death? Well, twofold. One, he's sick, so he's dying. Two, he's a sinner, and the consequence of moral transgression is death. So this is where he's, he's going in that direction. Both senses there are employed. And Dunn has always got more than one sense in mind, by the way. This is just the way his mind works. It's the way poet, poetry works. And worse, all my pleasures are like yesterday. He's got no joy in life left. If you're sick for any space of time, you have been robbed of your health, but also your joy. His pleasures are all gone. 
I dare not move my dim eyes any way, despair behind and death before doth cast such terror in my feeble flesh doth waste by sin in it. So now he connects the sickness to a moral problem and a, a personal problem. The personal problem is with the thou he spoke to right at the outset. Because sin was a violation of God's prohibition. And therefore a turning his back on God and sticking up the middle finger at that. For lack of a better way of expressing it. So not only did he not do what he was told, he deliberately, contemptuously did what God not knew he knew God didn't want him to do. Well, what is that other than contempt? And the worst part about it is the thing that it caused or brought about sin, not only separated from God, it's made him to die. What a terrible outcome. You can get what you want, but what, what you, <laughs> the thing that you wanted is the, the last thing that you would ever want. And he stuck with it. And worst of all, it towards howled off weight. Now the weight is as, as if there was a heaviness and thinking of weighing in the sense of gravity and the sense of hell being down. So it's pulling him down. Think of Dante's sense of hell being at the center of the earth. The, the, the sin and death are pulling him down so that, like it says in Genesis, he's made of dust and he'll return to dust. He, he's upright right now, standing on his two feet, although now he's on his sick bed and can't get off it, but eventually he's gonna be buried in the earth. So with that conclusion of the first eight lines, the octave, he is thinking about down. And then he immediately reverses that with a look up. Right, to see how that, like the twist there comes because the previous lines have pushed all down in one towards one direction. It finishes with toward hell doth way. Only thou art above and when towards thee by thy leave I can look. So now think about how sin is described in scripture which is to be, um, well, one of the words used for sin in scripture is to, uh, which we mentioned when we looked at the Oedipus text, uh, is to miss the mark, to miss the mark wholly. What was that word in Greek, do you remember? Hamartia, yeah. Right? And it means like you, you point your arrow at a target and not only do you miss the bullseye, you miss the target. You're like, and how much do you miss the target? Well, about this much. You, like, it's just the worst shot in history, missed the mark. And that's because you turned around first and took the shot. That's the problem. It isn't that you didn't just, you decide when you had your one shot that you weren't gonna shoot at that target, you were gonna turn around and shoot in the other direction. <clears throat> and now because of this, his whole person is looking downwards, it's leaning downwards, it's looking downwards, it's weighed downwards by gravity, and it's looking towards hell. And he can't, and that's where his death is inclining him, his eyes are dim, he can't see, he, he is in a state that he can't correct himself. However, however, it's not all so bad because God is not implicated in his sin. Only thou art above, and when towards thee by thy leave I can look. Now what's with the by thy leave? The grace of God is going to allow him to turn around. When you tell somebody they're a sinner, it's usually not perceived to be a flattering thing. It's not something you want to hear. It's not a compliment. It's not a compliment. You're a sinner. However, it's acquainting you with something about yourself you didn't know. You knew you could get sick. You knew that you did, didn't always do the best things. You didn't mean well. You knew all those things. You knew that sometimes you treat people the way they shouldn't be treated. But you never knew you were a sinner, because a sinner, that's a different category of things altogether. 
It's, a, it's, it's making a mar much more radical, significant claim, and it's something you never considered before. And the grace in that is it forces you to think about the problem in, in a deeper way, as maybe it's not just the problem, a natural problem that everyone who lives will die. There's something deeply wrong about it, and the wrongness is in relation to a person, and the person is God. You would not have known that without somebody telling you. It needs to be revealed to you. Animals die. Everything is, doesn't everything just die? That's the natural order of things. You would think so until somebody told you, no, it's not actually. It's not meant to be so. There's something wrong with this. It's, the problem is called sin. When you were told that there's sin in you, there's a grace that comes with that, and the grace that comes with it is that the category of sin is relational. It relates to God. Well, now you've been acquainted with the fact that there's a personal violation of relationship that's the cause of all of your problems. Okay? What's the further grace is that the purpose of acquainting you with that fact is to get you to turn around to the person that you had your back turned to. What? And that, that act is God's act. He's not sick. He's not implicated in our sin. He is not uh, in any ways corrupt or evil or ill-intentioned. And when that happens, then, then the turning around happens. And it, it, it's not presented here as turning around, but rather turning upwards. So before we were turned downwards, now we are turned upwards till we look up. Only thou art above, and when against thee by thy leave I can look, I rise again at that point. So this is the corrective to the natural inclination of sickness and death caused by sin. The counter move, I rise again. But here's the problem. This is a problem that happens even if you're a Christian. You still get sick. And you still sin. So this is where the, the next lines come. But our old subtle foe so tempteth me that not one hour myself I can sustain. I still find myself getting sick. I still find myself not loving God with my whole heart, not loving my neighbor as myself. I still find that. Even though I profess faith, I know I live by the grace of God, but I still, still, same problem. What then? Well, then comes the rhyming couplet. Thy grace may wing me to prevent his art, to keep it from even happening, that situation. And thou, like adamant, draw mine iron heart. Remember, the iron, again, pulls us downwards, but in this case, the iron filings will pull us upward, just like, as you can imagine, that picture of the magnet and the iron filings. Does that make sense at any rate? I mean, that's how the images are working. And, and note how sophisticated it is. It's subtle, it's rich, it's, it has a Christian orientation, and yet it, the images are ones that you can understand, I think. It's not that complicated. I'm going to skip over several of the other sonnets, even though I love them all. To the fifth one. The fifth one in one I began with a lengthy sort of discussion of microcosm, macrocosm. This is why. Because this is, it, it requires us to understand things in terms of little world, little order, like little cosmos. Uh, that's a problem. Okay, so I'll reduce it again. I'd like the whole thing to be there, but that's not going to work. Okay, that's all right. But you can see it. Uh, let me read it first. And you'll see f the, the first one begins with the problem of sickness and the death that ensues as a consequence of it. But it concluded with the corrective to that, which is that God is not hamstrung by our sin or by our death. In fact, he has remedied it by his grace and his resurrection. You could think that would be the end of the whole problem, but there's more to be said on the topic. The fifth sonnet is a brilliant one. I am a little world, a microcosm, made cunningly of elements and an angelic sprite. 
But black sin hath betrayed to endless night my world's both parts, and oh, both parts must die. You, which beyond that heaven which was most high have found new spheres and of new lands can write, pour new seas in mine eyes that so I might drown my world with my weeping earnestly, or wash it if it must be drowned no more, but oh, it must be burnt Alas, the fire of lust and envy have burnt it heretofore and made it fouler. Let their flames retire and burn me, O Lord, with a fiery zeal of thee and thy house, which doth in eating heal. This poem is chock full of biblical references. And I want to pull them out a little bit and so that you get a sense of what he's speaking of here. Now he's thinking again in the terms of microcosm and macrocosm, that's clear. And he's talk to, talking about human nature in terms of the way the ancient world saw it and the way his contemporaries still saw it. There are four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And then there's a fifth element, which they call ether. Remember back in uh, um, Ovid, Metamorphoses it talked about the elements right and the and the ether or this this element which is like fire uh, so that the idea is that um, there's an in, like a godlike element in each of us a spark of the divinity that's not just one of the four elements it's something from the heavens and here he's applying it to human nature we have a physical being we have a spiritual being. And both of them, the physical and the spiritual, are condemned to death. That's how he begins the problem. Because, and now he's talking about in terms of black sin. Uh, black here, it will be in terms of uh, using biblical language here. Sin is always portrayed as black, except when it's scarlet. Right? It's either one or the other. It's either black or it's scarlet. And it depends on the context. But it, it, it has no other colors. It's either black uh, or, or scarlet. And in each case, the antithesis to that, or the remedy to it, is white. The, 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 when it's red or scarlet, it will refer to blood. Right? It has the connotations of blood. And... Uh, blood has connotations of life. Black, on the other hand, has uh, more metaphysical connotations, the absence of light. So in John's Gospel, uh, he uses this repeatedly, light and darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not comprehended it. When Jesus is betrayed by Judas, at the Last Supper, we we're told that he goes out. Jesus says, go and do quickly what you came to do. And we're told that he leaves. And it, we're told it was night. Sort of funny little reference. But the light of the world is about to be handed over to the darkness. The light will be snuffed out for a, a, a short space of time, which is there at the crucifixion scene, by the way. When the, it's, the, it's, it's noon, and it's black for three hours. No light at all. If you're not getting the point, God's going to use the whole uh, celestial canvas to, shut, to t tell you what's going on right now. Right? There's no light in the middle of the day. When does this ever happen? An eclipse happens. Eclipses happen. This is a three-hour no-light eclipse. Never before or since. No such thing. You know that something's going on here. Uh, here, sin is referred to as black in the sense that it's the absence of the light which characterizes the presence of God. So sin takes the imago dei and, in a sense, it extinguishes it. We don't see it anymore. It, it annihilates. We're annihilated. Betrayed to endless night, my world's both parts, and oh, both parts must die. Now, in terms of the rhyme scheme, just to pick this up from the last time, Lee, Sprite, Knight, Die. Same thing. A, B, B, A. High, right, might, earnestly. Same thing. A, B, B, A. 
So the octave is there just like it was in the first. And with that, there tends to be when octaves, it deals with one subject in an octave. And then it moves on in the sestet to a different subject. Usually there's a progression or a response to the problem of, of the octave. And that would be the case here, that there's a change. But let me conclude with that, with the, the rhyme scheme at least. Uh, no more fire there to for retire. So C, D, C, D, and then we'll find the rhyming couplet at the end again. Zeal and heal. So exact same form. But the octave at any rate. So it moves from the first four, that it concludes with the problem, the first four lines that he, will, he must die and then it goes looking upwards. Now remember last time, it's only at the sestet, then it said, only thou art above. Like everything was pushing downwards for, and then after the eight lines in line nine, only thou art above, then he looks upward. Here he does it in line five. But now it's no longer thou, it's you. He's being polite with God. Why is he being polite with God? Yep, distance. Still God, but a God that he feels very distant from. You can speak of God as Adonai. God, the great high God. Still God. But Jehovah, Yahweh, this is a personal name. It, it, it reflects a covenantal personal relationship. Depending on which one you invoke, it reflects your state of mind towards the person you're addressing. When Jesus cries out at the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, Eloi is just a common, it, it's a distant. He's not calling him Abba. It's not, it's not Abba, Abba. It's Eloi, Eloi. Do you know what I'm talking about here? Sometimes God, uh, Jesus speaks to his father as Abba. You know, a, a little boy speaks to his father. Father, father, or daddy, or whatever. Here it's a distant. He's cut off, separated. That's the sense here. And it's just conveyed in a single word. I just bring that to your attention because in English, we're, we're, because of the way the English language development, it's polite forms in every context. We've lost a form that reflects that intimacy. And Dunn knows both, but here he's choosing the less intimate, more polite, but also more distant form. We, we can only convey it in English now through uh, things like Mr. or Doctor or Professor or whatever, title, right? So we'll respect, di distance, whatever, as opposed to calling everybody by the first name. But you, which above, beyond that heaven which was most high, have found new spheres and of new lands can write. Let me just stop there. What's he talking about in this, these lines? The new, the heaven that which was most high have found new spheres and of new lands can write. What's he talking about here? Do you know? He's referring to the, the new heaven and the new earth. So at the, at the end of the book of Revelation, so in the beginning it talks about, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. First line of Genesis. Towards the end of scripture, it talks about God restarting it all over again. There's a new heaven and a new earth. There was a heaven that was most high, but that also is being replaced. The one that's mentioned in Genesis 1, verse 1 is being replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. Not just a new earth, but a new heaven and a new earth. A whole new thing. So that which was most high had found new spheres and of new lands can write. So now he's thinking, he's not thinking only in the terms that he's looked at back in the first sonnet. Now he's thinking about eschatologically, things in the future. Pour new seas in mine eyes. 
that so I might drown my world with my weeping earnestly. So in the light of the eschaton, of the way things will be in the future, when I will be totally new, when everything is being made new, right? Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new, including this man. Let's start that right now by making my tears like a, a sea crying. so that the world of sin can be drowned. And then he makes a reference to, so here's the problem with that, the drowning of the whole world ha did happen once. It's called the flood. And God said he'll never do it again. No more flood, never again. Right, and then the olive branch from in the beak of the of the dove and the, and the rainbow, never again will the world be destroyed through water. And so he moves from that swiftly to another metaphor for cleansing, which is that of baptism. Or wash it if it must be drowned no more. Right, the waters of baptism, the wash off sin, come up. If you've ever been uh, baptized or in the presence of a baptism, uh, ritual, it has certain symbolic significances. You go down to death, you rise to life. You go down filthy with sin, you come up cleansed. Different ways of portraying it. He's seeing it slightly different, but he wants to deal with the problem of sin in both cases. And then he moves to the third way of dealing with it, but oh, it must be burnt. Talks about the, the fire the refiner's fire of God's holiness. This is how God deals with it going forward. It's not through washing, it's not through drowning, it's through burning. But it's the burning of the sort we saw in Mount Purgatory. Right? It's, it's purifying, it's taking off everything that is unclean or unrighteous or of this world and won't go stick with us. So he's, he's switching his presentation of the problem, but that's just how scripture does. So not going to be washed in the sense of destroyed, but burnt in the sense of purified. Burning hurts, by the way. <laughs> They've been burnt. Alas, and then he, so once he gets the idea of burning in his mind, by the way, at this point, he has now finished the octave and is moving to the sestet. So the octave concluded at earnestly. And then the sestet, he just sort of runs over from one line to the X, so to the next. So there is a sense in which, even though it concludes with a very tight rhyming couplet, the, the octave and the sestet, sestet sort of bleed together here. They're, they don't have a tight uh, gap between them. And so there's confusion within him on that that's expressed in the poem. He keeps flipping from one way of looking at it to the next. <coughs> but oh, it must be burnt. Okay, well, how about fire? Well, fire can be seen in multiple ways. Some of you wrote an essay on this, at least in relation to Virgil. Fire has multiple connotations. They're usually not good. They're usually related to burning with lust. It's usually something that is something to be avoided, right? So, you, you know, I'm on fire. Okay, great. Um, but actually, from a Christian vantage point, being on fire or being aroused or whatever is a, is a problem of, of, uh, of sin. And that's how he has been on fire before, is that... Uh, the fire of lust and envy have burned it heretofore and made it follow that sort of fire, enhanced the problem, didn't solve the problem. It's just like, so the water of drowning, God said he's not gonna do anymore. The water of baptism, well, that's not going to deal with a new creature entirely. The problem of burning, let's look at this in a different way. Now note that he just teases through different ways of understanding burning. And thus far, the burning has made things worse this is a different sort of burning that he needs then. It's a godly burning. It's a, it's a heaven-sent fire. 
Let their flames retire and burn me, O Lord, with a fiery zeal of thee and thy house. Now, now he goes back to the thee and the thy. He was a you before, and now he's gone to thee and the thy. So there's a progression there. And just know, it just subtly in the way he addresses God, it reflects that transformation. Which doth in eating heal. With a fiery zeal of thee and thy house. Where's this from? Do you know this line? I wonder if I can find it in a Google search. It's going to bring up done, but there may be a song. Hmm. Psalm 69, verse 9. For the zeal of thy house consumes me in the insults of those who insult you, Paul and me. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproaches. But this is the line. Psalm 69, verse 9. The zeal of thy house consumes me. But now the zeal, which is an earnest desire for something, is consuming him. What's it consuming of him? The sin is being burnt up. It's a funny old thing. A desire which turns around on us and gets rid of everything that would prevent us from meeting the object that we desire. Because we, God's holy and we are not. Yeah. Interesting way to conclude the poem, huh? Well, God is presented as a, cons uh, is a consuming fire. God, yeah. We experience it as in terms of pain, suffering, but the suffering there, the purpose of the suffering is to make us fit to receive the embrace for which we're designed. It's a very different sort of burning, yeah. So see how he plays with that. Like Dante didn't deal with, didn't bother in the, infer even though it's called the Inferno. The idea of hell as a hot place of, and I said that it's sort of challenging. He presents it as an icy cold place, but it's related to his sense of physics and so forth. And, <coughs> and he knows perfectly well how scripture just uh, describes hell, and he's not disputing that. He's just imagining it differently. But this is the traditional way uh, of referring to hell as a, as a place of fire. Now, in the case of, of hell, this is not hell fire. This is God fire. Don't confuse the two. Hellfire is not going to purify you. But this fire from the presence of God is going to. It doesn't mean you're going to enjoy. Nobody enjoys the burning. Burning agonizing. But the agony here is getting rid of the thing that is the impediment to the object of ultimate joy the lover of your soul, if you will. See how it works? It's it. Anyway. Uh, he's being burned because God loves him. But he calls for it. For the, law, the, the removal of a certain type of fire, which he wants, with a, a certain type of fire which he doesn't want and yet he asks for God to give it to him what he doesn't want because that's the thing that will bring him to the person he does want namely God and he wants God because he wants life he wants life because God's grace has shown to him that he's a sinner and that he's going to suffer ultimate damnation for not being rightly ordered towards God in everything. But again, it, there, note that he has to call upon God to do this. He can't say, well, from now on, I am going to resolve to be holy. He, he, it's, 
and he has to as an imperative and burn me O Lord <coughs> with a fiery zeal now with zeal if I talk about my zeal it's something that I tend to associate with myself Dunn is a little bit more sophisticated than that give me the zeal because this is a holy zeal it comes from God I cannot I can't work up this for, sort of zeal you need to do this so he's very clear sighted in this The only thing that he is his own, which he can own up to, is his own scent. That's it. Everything good will come from God, so he calls upon God for that. Including in this case, the fire which will consume him. I would love to do the tenth psalm, referenced to death, but I'm going to skip over that for space of time because I then couldn't get to Psalm 14, which I dearly love and don't want to miss up, miss out on. Uh, this is the most uh, controversial of Dunn's holy sonnet sequence, I think because he's playing, again, he's using biblical imagery and biblical language throughout, uh, but he's wedding it to, again, ideas of cosmology, what we saw, which we saw last time, right? Um, and so the understanding of science and the understanding of theology go hand in glove for him. They just simply, these are different ways of saying the same thing. And, uh, to some degree, the reason I find Dunn so delightful is that he has a language to do that in his day, which we have largely lost. It's hard for me to speak in terms of the way modern science looks at the world and infuse it with Christian theology. It's a, they seem to forbid one another. I don't think that they do, per se, but the integration is not taking place. Science is seen as a dispassionate, neutral endeavor. It's, it's a process that you undergo, but it's not, it, it hasn't, doesn't have the intentionality of God or of people in it. In fact, part of the scientific method is to abstract your intentions from it. You're to replicate that in a neutral fashion. That's a topic unto itself, but uh, this one is once again directed to a person and the person here is God, and the God in mind here is the Trinitarian God, hence reference to a three-personed God. And it has a different sort of resonance in view here, and that is, I already, we had talked about relation here, but here it's more strongly in terms of erotic relations, and specifically the relation between God and his people is presented from the time of the the 12, the 12 prophets, the minor prophets, in terms of, of marriage. God is presented as a bridegroom and his people are the bride. <coughs> the first of the 12 prophets is the book of Hosea. Look at how Hosea begins. God refers to his people as a harlot, a whore. It's, hard, it's not flattering. Not a reference to women, by the way. It's a reference to a whole people. But, and, and so that conflation of a people with a bride or a disloyal bride is there from the prophetic era all the way onwards, and it carries on all the way to the, the book of Revelation, where we get, we get two groups being presented. There's the people of Babylon the Great, the whore, the great whore, and then we get the heavenly Jerusalem, the bride, right? So it's, it's, again, it pushes in that direction of a certain image. And that image gets stronger as the biblical revelation progresses to the point where the end, where it's just there are two people. And they're inclined totally in this direction or totally in that direction. <coughs> Dunn, still writing personally, individually, 
speaks of God in these terms, but he, when he does so, he talks in the corporate terms of the church as well. So he sort of represents every man, and every man represents the entire body of Christ, or the entire heavenly Jerusalem, if you will. So it has all of those images. He's going to pick up on the idea of a person, a lover, a bride, that sort of relationship, a city, and even an entire people. All of those get pulled in here, but you need to have in mind that, that image of a, uh, of a person uh, with a corporate side, as like a city, because that, he, he uses that throughout here. You see, it's strongly biblical, but it moves the discussion away from what we've looked at thus far, which is just sickness and health, into a more eschatologically uh, f fulsome presentation, which we get here. So let me just read it. Uh, you might find it shocking. But note the rhyme scheme. I'll say it from the outset, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. C, D, C, D, E, E, exact same rhyme scheme, right? It's consistent. Batter my heart, three person God for you as yet, but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like an usurped town to another do labor to admit you but owe to no end reason your viceroy in me me should defend but it's captive and proves weak or untrue yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain but am betrothed unto your enemy divorce me untie or break that knot again take me to you Imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. I said it was scandalous. And if you understood what just was asked for at the end, then you would understand why I said it's scandalous. But he's using imagery that's there in scripture. And he's just pushing it a little bit further than you would find comfortable. However, this sort of language is also used in scripture. And again, we usually sort of whitewash it even in translations. Like I, I can see people wincing when I use the word horror or harlot and so forth. You know? uh, there, there's worse language in scripture than that. I mean, it's very strong. And uh, I, I'm not sure we're doing ourselves favors by sort of trying to find mm, a little bit more polite ways of putting that. Is there more polite? Well, I'm not sure how you put that politely. Without losing this, the, the force of it, there's a reason why that word's being used. Uh, it's not supposed to be well received. But it begins, again, with the most extraordinary introduction to any poem in the language uh, with a command to God to batter. Right? It's, it's forceful and the whole poem is violent. The whole poem. It's, it's a violent poem. It's got the same structure as before but it's, it's more vehement than everything that came before this. Right? It's, it's, there's a, and there's almost a um, desperation in this now because he he's got the problem which we all have he says he's a sinner he acknowledges he's a sinner he knows that he's a sinner saved by grace here's his problem he keeps on sinning and he knows the consequences of sin is death so then he wonders what on earth is going on the things that I don't want to do I keep on doing the things that I do want to do I don't do so what am I going to do what Paul talks about in Romans 6 and 7. Here's my problem. That's a serious problem. And yet you say that you're a Christian, you believe this, but you act like that. Like, what, what's going on? This is what Dunn is dealing with here. This is exactly the same scenario. 
And so if he can't solve the problem, he needs help. And he's already asked God many times, and it hasn't solved the problem. So let me just ask again. Let me just ask by shouting. <laughs> Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to man. Now when I say knock, don't think knock on the door. Think of like a pushing. Think of, and I don't know if you've ever seen this, when somebody does uh, cleans brass. Have you ever tried to clean brass? Do you know what brass is? It's a metal that sort of oxidizes. It goes very dull very quickly. It's really hard to keep shiny. If you have any brass, most people don't have brass anymore, but if you do, you, there's a certain polish that you can get for it, but you have to, you still have to, some, you have to rub it. And that's what is in minded here. So it's, he's knocking, he's breathing on it, and he's trying, he's really pushing to make it glisten. Is he supposed to be glistening? And he's not. He looks like the, remember I used the, the analogy of the, the diamond and the black matte background? He looks like the black matte background. I want to shine. <laughs> How is that going to happen? At this point, you've been doing, you've been pretty soft with me, and it's not working. That I may rise and stand or throw me. So paradox, for me to stand, I need to fall. Not only do I need to fall, you need to take me down. You need to, that, the sinful rebel that I am needs to stop being in charge. I need to be overthrown. And bend your force, and look at the parallelism. So it was knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, and it goes to break, blow, burn, and make me new. Compare and contrast. Knock, break, breathe, blow, shine, burn. Seek to mend, make me new. Intensification in each case. Uh, the fact that he does not use the word and in the, uh, well, he uses alliteration here as well, break, blow, burn, blah, blah, blah. But also intensification of these, but again, no and in between. Uh, it's a figure of speech called an ascendetic treacle on it's pulling things together tightly. It expresses his emotional vehemence at this point. But it's clear the, imp the import of what he's saying here is that I need not just more, but a different order of help. Something completely different. And here's, the pro here's why this introduces the problem right here. I like an usurped town. What, do you know what a usurped town is? Or a usurper? Sorry? Yes. A mutiny has taken place and a foreign power has occupied the city. Think of how that happens in the ancient world. Like sometimes they get sieged, and they, but at this point, a usurper has come and now it's under enemy occupation. The city no longer it belongs to the original uh, king. The city has been taken. To another do, labor to admit you, but owe to no end. Reason your viceroy in me, me, should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. I can't think myself out of this problem. <coughs> I belong to another. Another power, another country, another entity. Babylon the Great, the Roman Empire. We tend to present these things in political terms. So does scripture. Right? There's a political, civic level, just like the city of God. Right? In Plato's Republic, you can see it individually, but you can also see it in a corporate way. Same thing here. And there he is. It's reason should direct him out of the problem, but, the, but reason isn't going to do it. He can't, he, can't, he can't think himself out of the problem of sin. So what is, going to, what is the issue then? Someone needs to come in, and again, the call is for God to do it. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain. This is the same way of saying the same thing twice. Fain means dearly. 
dearly I love you and would be loved dearly, but am betrothed unto your enemy. There's the problem now. It's not only that he's a, a town that has been captured by an enemy, but that he is married to that enemy now. And again, the command, the imperatives, divorce me, untie or break that knot again, the threefold repetition just like above. Take me to you, imprison me, for I except you enthrall me unless you make me a slave, never shall be free, nor ever chaste except you ravish me. Now the ravishing is again violent sexual. It's, it's, it's in, intensely unsettling. Should have a warning on this <laughs> lecture. Trigger alert, this is not uh, comfortable stuff. But it's, met, it's metaphorical language to express extreme distress. And also note the way in which I, there's a connection here between slavery, or even better than this, freedom, and being rightly orientated towards God. You can't be free unless God is at the center of your existence. So all the talks about liberty in our day, political and otherwise, that ignore the theological dimension are missing part of, and the most important part of it, which is that when we are freed to do what we were made to do, which is to worship God and enjoy him forever, then we are free. If the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Whereas if you are not free, then you are effectively, you are a slave, whatever your social status is. You are a slave to sin. In fact, that's how Paul puts it in Romans. And in fact, he puts it, he puts it in terms of not, not even freedom. You're a slave one way or another. You're going to be a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. Which one do you want to be? But you're not your own. Are you going to be a slave to sin? Tyndale's motto is Duloi Christu, slaves of Christ. You can say servants, but slave is, Dulos is more of a, Has the character of that? Yes. You say he's doing hyperbolic language. Oh yeah. yeah. He done and hyperbole almost are synonymous. Yeah, extraordinarily hyperbolic language. And again, fitting for poetry. You don't go around talking like this. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I, I'm a professor of poetry. I don't go around talking like this with anyone. However, for poetry, it expresses something deep and profound that needs this sort of language to adequately capture the importance of the situation. And in this case, there's a sickness and a health, and there's a certain type of health which, is, which orders the other sorts of health, and that's a spiritual health, and that, that only comes through God's intense love of a particular sort. As I say, I think it's, it, it could be misunderstood to be offensive. It's just appropriate to the situation and should not be applied in its normal earthly sense. Or you will be terribly offended and misunderstand what's going on. But anyway, I've tried to give a sense of it. But you see the three poems in a sequence, all with the same rhyme scheme, all holy sonnets. By the way, sonnets are also from the beginning. I didn't say this because I think I already understood it. Francesco Petrarch, this is courtly love poetry. That's, it's always written by a man for a woman. And Dunn is writing it to God. But he's the woman, and God's the man. Interesting, right? He's part of the Bride of Christ. So he's using the convention, but he's, he's, he's messing with it a bit. Okay? Anyway, I'll see you next time. <laughs>